Well, welcome everyone. Um, we're working today uh, for you because today is actually all about you. And the session that I was asked to run this morning was about business best practice. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and they're up here on the board. So, and you've got, this is a bit like speed dating. You'll have two minutes for each question. So who are you? What's your name? What is your business? <coughs> what does your business do? And where is it located? So that's the first piece of information that we'd like to do. So if you can do that, and if we can finish that and ask all of those questions by, in two minutes, that would be fantastic, please. Thank you. One of the things that I thought today would be really good when we were talking about what we were going to do for this session is to actually get you to start to really think about your business. I've got 25 years of in tourism and hospitality. So I've had tour companies on Fraser Island. I've been involved. I had my own travel agency here for a number of years. We had a dive company here. And I also wrote seven award submissions, but this was quite some years ago before I went into learning and development. So I know the passion. One of the things that I also know is that when you're working in your business instead of on your business, there are some things that you don't get time to think about. So this session today is going to give you some time to think about your business. Rather than working in your business, we're going to get you, we call it the bird's eye view rather than the worm's eye view. Warren Buffett. Now, who's got the ball? Who, who ended up with the ball? Ah, oh, Rob, do you want to keep it or throw it? Um, oh, awesome. There you go. Michelle, would you just mind reading that? Sure. It takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. Warren Buffett. Who remembers the old telephone boxes that used to sit on the corners? Yeah? Very a story. Who has anyone here heard of Edward de Bono? Yes. Yep, some. Yep, some has. You've got the ball. Do you want to keep it or throw it, Michelle? I'll throw it. You'll throw it. Wonderful. <laughs> Mari, you get a job if you get the ball. By the way, red telephone boxes. They had a they had a couple of challenges many many years ago. So I'm going to take you right back to the 1950s, post war, and the challenges that they had with their business were twofold. They had a lot of customer service complaints, but they also had a lot of people that um, had conflict because there were no telephones in homes in those days. They were all, people would have to go, and I unfortunately remember, not that I was born in the 50s, by the way, <laughs> but I remember actually having to go to these red telephone boxes and line up in the middle of winter in Sydney. And of course, you'd be there for ages and Martha would be there talking to their friend for hours and you just, well, I'm getting some nods from people that are yeah. my vintage around here. On yeah. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> these, um, the, what the Red Telephone Company had, because they were getting increasing um, complaints, they had, uh, they hired two consulting firms and they said to these two consulting firms, look, we want to decrease our customer service complaints, but we want to increase the revenue on our local phone calls. And so the customer service, um, uh, sorry, the consultants came back with a whole heap of uh, challenging, some challenging thoughts. So I'm going to get Vari. Would you mind just popping out here, Vari, for me? It's all right. I'm just going to give you a pen and you're just going to write up some notes on this uh, board here. And I want you to think of yourselves right now as consultants. I want you to be thinking about if you were the red telephone company, what would you have done? And by the way, there's spell check up here. Right, that's our spell check, so it doesn't matter how you write, it'll be fine. Um, I want you to think about what, if you were the consulting company, red telephone boxes, post-war, there's not a lot of money around, it was back in the pounds and pence. How would you increase the customer, the, um, the revenue and decrease the customer service complaints? Time phone calls, yep. Yep, so you'd more boxes. Yep, take the glass out so it's cold inside. Yeah, okay, so entertainment, provide some entertainment, yeah, yep. So increase the time, uh, sorry, the call price, waiting benches, sanitizer, <laughs> Carla? So there's a whole range of things up here. Now, what they did, because, and they're all great ideas, but because we're post-war, we don't have money, there are a lot of challenges with this, because if you think about this was all going to cost hundreds of thousands of pounds in the time. 
And they said, look, we just simply don't have the funds for that. So they called in Edward de Bono, who is actually, they've, they've named him the father of lateral thinking. And that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be thinking a little bit outside the box. And what they said to him is, look, Eddie, old pal, what would you do? And he said, well, he said, I, I have a solution for you and it's going to cost you less than one pound per phone. And I went, you've got to be kidding. We've just had these consultants. They've said it's going to cost hundreds of thousands. They've come up with these great ideas, but impractical. And he said, look, all you actually need to do is actually put a lead piece in the mouthpiece of the phone. Because as a person goes into the phone booth, their arm gets heavy and they'll hang up earlier. Now, this is a true story. What happened to that company, to the Red Telephone Company, was they decreased their customer service complaints to nothing. And they increased their revenue in the first three months. Now, you can research this, by the way, on Google. This is what we start talking about when we start talking about business best practice. We're not talking about you working in your business. We're talking about you thinking a little bit laterally because what happens, I'm just right in the middle of studying my neuroscience in leadership, which is a fascinating subject. And what we do is we get very fixed with our ideas. Now, these awards that you're entering into, you'll have your ideas about what you want to do and how you want to do them. And you're going to hear later on from Rob some things about uh, some guidelines. What I want you to start thinking about is what is, your, what is your business and why are you actually doing your business? Not what are you doing, but why are you doing it? Yep, here we go, Lise. Lise, would you just mind reading this for me, please? Business or tourism excellence. To be a successful tourism and business award applicant, you need to provide excellent submission, which includes showing success. Successful tourism and businesses award applications show business engaged in quality business planning, implements positive change strategies, adopts new trends and innovation, and generally is a business of excellence. Success, obviously. <laughs> the forum will help you gain insight on how to be an award worthy business through better business planning, adoption of industry trends, and will also show you the necessary skills to create an award worthy tourism submission. Thanks, Lise. So what is best practice? And, and again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, and I've got a handout for you that we've, uh, that we've got, which we'll, we might hand out at the end, if that's OK. Um, but what is best practice, and what does that actually mean? One of the things that I find in working with uh, the business that I do, and that's learning and development and organisational development, is going in and looking at business practice and how you do things. It's looking at those innovative ideas, it's about that creative, those creative juices that you have. And so I've just got a list here, and again, I'm not going to drill down on these because um, we're going to actually drill down on what you and why you're doing what you're doing. And I'll, I'll expand on that in a moment. So managing best practice, improving business operation through best practice, best practice in sales and marketing, marketing, encouraging innovation, using IT to achieve best practice, sustainability, and of course, workplace health and safety. And as I said, we've got a handout which can expand on all of that a little bit later on. What I want to start asking you was a, a, a question that I was asked sitting on a plane. I work with a large organisation in Tasmania called Tassel, and they grow salmon. And they've also do a whole range of stuff within the tourism industry, funnily enough. They, um, I've been working with them for five years. So every month I go down for a week at a time and I, I'm doing a whole range of things on their safety leadership program. And I work with them to do a whole heap of improvements in their business. And I sat next to a man on the plane, this man actually, and he had this presence about him. And I thought, wow, you know, this man, is, he, he was really intriguing. And I thought he was a little bit arrogant when I first met him, because he was talking. It was one of those that, as they're shutting the door on the plane and he's still sitting down talking on his phone. Anyway, he got off his phone, he turned around to me and he said, oh, what do you do? And I said, oh, you know, I'm learning and develop organisational development. And he said, well, that's great. He said, but um, can you tell me what your why is? And I said, what do you mean what my why is? 
And he said, well, why do you do what you do? And oh, I'm passionate, you know, I love learning and development and I, and I love helping people. And he said, no, he said, that's telling me uh, what you do, but it's not telling me why you do it. And I looked at him and I said, look, I'm really confused. I'm, I felt actually quite silly because I thought, yeah, I thought, I said to him, look, I, I don't understand. Could you help me out here? What do you do? And he said, oh, well, I'm the chairman of Greening Australia. And he said, I chair about six different boards. And he said, um, I have my why. And I went, can you just expand on that a bit further? And he said, well, my why, he said, and understanding that he's with Greening Australia, he said, my why is I am the custodian of people's future. So he said, every decision I make, everything I do as a chairman is around being a custodian of people's future. And I looked at him and went, wow, okay, wow, that's huge. And he said, so what's your why? I went, I have no idea. I, I have no idea. I said, I'm, he said, no, I know you're passionate, but why do you get out of bed? Why do you do what you do? And I said, look, could I come back to you on that? Because I really, I really don't know. Anyway, he said, yeah, and he gave me his card. And he said, I'm, I'm going to give you this card. I do want you to come back to me. And I said, yep. Yeah. And three months later, it took me three months <coughs> to figure out what my why was and is today. And I'll share what my why is with you <coughs> a little bit later on, because we're, I'm going to ask you what your why is. One of the reasons I'm going to ask you what your why is, and we're going to do a little bit of workshopping on this, is because unless you have clarity in these awards, unless you, because you can, you can write a whole heap of words, that's easy, but unless you can have clarity about what your why is, unless you can actually have that right throughout your submission, and trust me, the judges look for those things. And unless you know what actually makes you get out of bed, or if you just bought a business because you've bought a business and you've landed in it, have you actually stepped into that? And, and often when I'm talking to people and when I'm talking to leaders, I uh, talk to CEOs, they've stepped into a position or they've bought a business, but they haven't actually owned it. So today is about you owning whatever it is that you are doing and finding out what your why is. I've got a video that I'm going to play for you and it's Simon Sinek. Has anyone heard of Simon Sinek? No? Simon Sinek is, is an amazing man. You can also Google Simon Sinek. But he's going to talk to you about the why of your business. And some of the most successful businesses in the world work with their why first. So think about what your why is. I'm actually not going to play it on there because it doesn't fill the whole screen. So just bear with me for a second. How do you explain when things don't go as we assume? Or better, how do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions? For example, why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition. And yet, they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access to the same talent, the same agencies, the same consultants, the same media. Then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America, and he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day. Why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out controlled powered man flight when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, and they didn't achieve powered man flight, and the Wright brothers beat them to it? There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery. And this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operate in it. 
as it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it, and it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has, you know, leather seats, buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with, anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Here's the best part. None of what I'm telling you is my opinion. It's all grounded in the tenets of biology, not psychology, biology. If you look at a cross-section of the human brain looking from the top down, what you see is the human brain is actually broken into three major components that correlate perfectly with the golden circle. Our newest brain, our homo sapien brain, our neocortex, corresponds with the what level. The neocortex is responsible for all of our rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections make up our limbic brains, and our limbic brains are responsible for all of our feelings, like trust and loyalty. It's also responsible for all human behavior, 
all decision making, and it has no capacity for language. In other words, when we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal and want to be a part of what it is what you, that you do? Again, the goal is not just to sell people who need what you have. The goal is to sell to people who believe what you believe. The goal is not just to hire people who need a job. It's to hire people who believe what you believe. I always say that you know, there's, uh, if you, if you, if you um, Hire people just because they can do a job, they'll work for your money. But if you hire people who believe what you believe, they work for you with blood and sweat and tears. And nowhere, nowhere else is there a better example of this than with the Wright brothers. Most people don't know about Samuel Pierpont Langley. And back in the early 20th century, the pursuit of powered man flight was like the dot com of the day. Everybody was trying it. And Samuel Pierpont Langley had what we assume to be the recipe for success. I mean, even now, you ask people, why did your product or why did your company fail? And people always give you the permu same permutation of the same three things. Undercapitalized, the wrong people, bad market conditions. It's always the same three things. So let's explore that. Samuel Pierpont Langley was given $50,000 by the War Department to figure out this flying machine. Money was no problem. He held a seat at Harvard and worked at the Smithsonian and was extremely well connected. He knew all the big minds of the day. He hired the best minds money could find, and the market conditions were fantastic. The New York Times followed him around everywhere, and everyone was rooting for Langley. And how come we've never heard of Samuel Pierpont Langley? A few hundred miles away in Dayton, Ohio, Orville and Wilbur Wright. They had none of what we consider to be the recipe for success. They had no money. They paid for their dream with the proceeds from their bicycle shop. Not a single person on the Wright brothers team had a college education, not even Orville or Wilbur. And the New York Times followed them around nowhere. The difference was Orville and Wilbur were driven by a cause, by a purpose, by a belief. They believed that if they could figure out this flying machine, it'll change the course of the world. Samuel Pierpont Langley was different. He wanted to be rich, and he wanted to be famous. He was in pursuit of the result. He was in pursuit of the riches. And lo and behold, look what happened. The people who believed in the Wright brothers' dream worked with them with, for, with blood and sweat and tears. The others just worked for the paycheck. And they tell stories of how every time the Wright brothers went out, they would have to take five sets of parts, because that's how many times they would crash before they came in for supper. And eventually, on December 17th, 1903, the Wright brothers took flight, and no one was there to even experience it. We found out about it a few days later. And further proof that Langley was motivated by the wrong thing, the day the Wright brothers took flight, he quit. He could have said, that's an amazing discovery, guys. Now we'll improve upon your technology. But he didn't. He wasn't first. He didn't get rich. He didn't get famous. So he quit. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And if you talk about what you believe, you will attract those who believe what you believe. Well, why is it important to attract those who believe what you believe? Something called the law of diffusion of innovation. And if you don't know the law, you definitely know the terminology. The first 2.5% of our population are our innovators. The next 13.5% of our population are our early adopters. The next 34% are your early majority, your late majority, and your laggards. The only reason these people buy touch-tone phones is because you can't buy rotary phones anymore. <laughs>
We all sit at various places at various times on the scale, but what the law of diffusion of innovation tells us is that if you want mass market success or mass market acceptance of an idea, you cannot have it until you achieve this tipping point between 15 and 18% market penetration, and then the system tips. And I love asking businesses, what's your conversion on new business? And they love to tell you, oh, it's about 10%, proudly. Well, you can trip over 10% of the customers. We all have about 10% who just get it. That's how we describe them, right? That's like that gut feeling, oh, they just get it. The problem is how do you find the ones that just get it before you're doing business with them versus the ones who don't get it? So it's this here, this little gap, that you have to close, as Jeffrey Moore calls it, cl cl uh, crossing the chasm. Because you see, the early majority will not try something until someone else has tried it first. And these guys, the innovators and the early adopters, they're comfortable making those gut decisions. They're more comfortable making those intuitive decisions that are driven by what they believe about the world and not just what product is available. These are the people who stood online for six hours to buy an iPhone when they first came out, when you could have just walked into the store the next week and bought one off the shelf. These are the people who spent $40,000 on flat screen TVs when they first came out, even though the technology was substandard. And by the way, they didn't do it because the technology was so great. They did it for themselves. It's because they wanted to be first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. In fact, people will do the things that prove what they believe. The reason that person bought the iPhone on the first, in the first six hours, or stood in, six, in line for six hours, was because of what they believed about the world and how they wanted everybody to see them. They were first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So let me give you a famous example, a famous failure and a famous success of the law of diffusion of innovation. First, the famous failure. It's a commercial example. As we said before a second ago, the recipe for success is money and the right people and the right marketing conditions, right? You should have success then. Look at TiVo. From the time TiVo came out about eight or nine years ago to this current day, they are the single highest quality product on the market. Hands down, there is no dispute. They were extremely well-funded. Market conditions were fantastic. I mean, we use TiVo as a verb. I TiVo stuff on my piece of junk Time Warner DVR all the time. But TiVo is a commercial failure. They've never made money. And when they went IPO, their stock was at about $30 or $40 and then plummeted, and it's never traded above 10. In fact, I don't think it's even traded above six, except for a couple of little spikes. Because you see, when TiVo launched their product, they told us all what they had. They said, we have a product that pauses live TV, skips commercials, rewinds live TV, and memorizes your viewing habits without you even asking. And the cynical majority said, we don't believe you. We don't need it. We don't like it. You're scaring us. What if they had said, if you're the kind of person who likes to have total control over every aspect of your life, boy, do we have a product for you. It pauses live TV, skips commercials, memorizes your viewing habits, et cetera, et cetera. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, and what you do simply serves as the proof of what you believe. Now let me give you a successful example of the law of diffusion of innovation. In the summer of 1963, 250,000 people showed up on the mall in Washington to hear Dr. King speak. They sent out no invitations, and there was no website to check the date. How do you do that? Well, Dr. King wasn't the only man in America who was, the, who was a great orator. He wasn't the only man in America who suffered in a pre-civil rights America. In fact, some of his ideas were bad, but he had a gift. He didn't go around telling people what needed to change in America. He, you know, he went around and told people what he believed. I believe, I believe, I believe, he told people. And people who believed what he believed took his cause and they made it their own, and they told people. And some of those people uh, created structures to get the word out to even more people. And lo and behold, 250,000 people showed up on the right day, on the right time, to hear him speak. How many of them showed up for him, zero. They showed up for themselves. 
It's what they believed about America that got them to travel on a bus for eight hours to stand in the sun in Washington for, in the middle of August. It's what they believed, and it wasn't about black versus white. 25% of the audience was white. Dr. King believed that there were two types of laws in this world, those that are made by a higher authority, authority and those that are made by man. And not until all the laws that are made by man are consistent with the laws that are made by the higher authority will we live in a just world. It just so happens that the Civil Rights Movement was the perfect thing to help him bring his cause to life. We followed not him, not for him, but for ourselves. And by the way, he gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. <laughs> Listen to politicians now with their comprehensive 12 point plans, they're not inspiring anybody. Because there are leaders and there are those who lead. Leaders hold a position of power or authority, but those who lead inspire us. Whether they're individuals or organizations, we follow those who lead, not because we have to, but because we want to. We follow those who lead, not for them, but for ourselves. And it's those who start with why that have the ability to inspire those around them or find others who inspire them. Thank you very much. So just some thoughts from you about that. Tell me about your why. Tell me what, what moved you in terms of your business and have you ever thought about it? I would like the red group to get together and the blue group to get together. We've got some flip chart paper down there. And I want you to talk amongst yourselves and just jot down some notes about why, why are you doing what you're doing? Have you just bought a business? Or do you actually have a passion about it? Why tourism? What, 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 what is it about tourism? So have these conversations. Why this business? And why are you entering the awards? What's the reason that you're actually entering? And then we're going to come back. So I'm going to give you a quick five minutes to just jot down some notes around this. So if you can separate out into your groups, we're going to discover that why, and then we're going to figure out what your why is. All right, so what have you come up with? Why tourism? Why are you, going, why are you doing this? Um, because it's about creating experiences and lifetime memories. It's not just like about hiring a boat, it's actually about creating a lifetime memory that no one's going to talk about it. Um, it's about educating people to appreciate the environment, I think that's what Kay was saying, and putting extras in, not just delivering the product, but trying to always put that extra bit in, um, and creating like a synergistic effect because everything is all working beautifully together. Um, and then we didn't really do the two little ones, we went straight to the last one. And these are our reasons for entering the awards. So to create a sense of positivity in the community, uh, recognition for your business, increase your profile, exposure for your business, um, look at your business from the outside in, what you said before about bird's eye view, not worm view. Um, it focuses you as a business on proper procedures and policies and plans and stuff. And networking, obviously with other businesses like we are today, we're all um, learning from each other and learning leadership skills. Yeah, well done. Um, Round of applause. That was good. Well done. Thank you. Awesome. Well, so over to you. You do it. No, you do it. No, no, no. You, you do, do it. She's a popular choice. She's a popular choice. Wonderful. She's blue too. She's blue. blue. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think we ended up entering um, why are we entering the awards first. So we discussed that it was a great uh, source of recognition for the, the business. Um, it's a way to make you as a business owner or the, the business itself feel good. Um, it pushes you to innovate further down the line throughout the year um, and in years to come. Um, it also makes you look back on your business and reflect on ways in which you've grown and become better and changed. Um, 
it's a good way to self-assess um, and it's also, uh, it also acts as an, an innovation tool and a planning tool. Uh, number two, what was this one? Why tourism? I think it was. <laughs> Sorry, we're all over the place. Um, so why tourism? Uh, so feel good products. We make people, uh, our customers, our clients feel good. Um, we also make a difference uh, to their lives um, in by allowing them to experience <coughs> enjoyable products, um, that kind of thing. Um, we facilitate an experience, so an experience where their memory, um, or an, an experience which will last with them, create a lasting memory, um, and yeah, add to the visitors' memories. Number three, what was this? Why, why this business? Um, because of a, a passion for the product or service, and that was about as far as we ended up getting. <laughs> okay. Well done, yeah. round of applause. So they're all great. The key to harnessing that passion or understanding your why, why are you passionate about your business? Because we're all passionate. But you know what, at the end of the day, unless you have your why, unless you know why you're doing what you're doing, it's not, you're not gonna stand out. You're not, it's not gonna come through your writing. It's not, you're not gonna have clarity. You're just gonna be like every other award submission. Best practice is not just about writing a good business plan. It's not just about writing down words on a piece of paper. And I think, Deb, you can attest to that. There are different ways of doing things. Being able to be very concise is the key. So is it because, in this instance, that they helped you lose 30 pounds, get off all your medication and have a new lease on life? And this was a, um, this was a weight loss uh, thing that I actually um, got this from. And, you know, the reason that um, in this particular weight loss business, it was actually the lady that I was talking to, her why was to help people save lives. It wasn't actually to help people lose weight. And if I look at, um, and, and one of the things that I want you to be thinking about is the um, cinemas. When you go to a cinema, they make millions of dollars, don't they? Cinemas? Yeah, billions of dollars. And you know, they're probably one of the only products, well there are a couple of other products, but I can't talk about those in this forum, because they're like after nine o'clock products, but they're one of the only products that people, you will go in and you will pay your $17, you will actually sit down and you will watch two and a half hours of something and you will walk away with nothing else but a feeling, an experience. You don't walk away with a product. You walk away with a memory. And yet they make billions of dollars and that's what you do. That's what a lot of people do in this industry. Now they make billions of dollars, but they also know their why. Their why is to motivate you to come and sit down and watch them. And that's what we need to get into your award submission. That's what's gonna make you stand out, this clarity. Oops, sorry. So, that's your why. That's the story you need to share. I can stand here and I can talk to you about how, what best practice is. I can talk to you about your business plans, your vision and your mission statements, but you all know that. You all know how to write business plans. So who, who doesn't? That's probably a better question. Who doesn't? Not very good. Not very good. Okay, well, that, that's wonderful. I have had to work on it. Yep. Really hard and I hate it. I hate it. Yeah, and do you know what? Often people with passion do, and particularly because we do have a passion, we want to actually be doing what we're doing and not working on the business. Well, can I tell you, most businesses around the world don't survive on passion alone. You can be as passionate as you like, but unless you have that belief, and if you, if you can't work on it on your own or that's not your key, then get somebody in that can. The why about entering the awards, though, I think is as critically as important because if you're entering into them because you want the kudos and you don't win, then your expectation, your map of the world, your expectation is going to be, oh crap, I haven't won, so my product must be shocking. Well, that's not the case. So think about your why about entering these awards as well. 
If your why is, I want to be the best that I can be. And this, these awards are going to help me to work on my business. They're going to help me define my business plan. They're going to help me to look at my chart of accounts. They're going to help me to do all of these things. And a byproduct could be that I might win. But I'm also going to, as part of these awards, be part of a wonderful community. So is it just for you that you're entering the awards or is it because you want to be part of a community that has awesome award-winning products in the Wit Sundays? So what is your why for winning? And, and I don't expect you actually to be able to answer that to me right now. Um, because I, you know, it took me two and a half months to figure that out. Why? And I, and I remember Rod Douglas, and he, he, when he gave me his card, and he said, you will get in contact with me, won't you? And I said, I will. And I was quite nervous, because I thought, wow, there's this really big man, you know, he's chairman of all of these boards. I emailed him three months later and said, oh, I've got my why. And I said, but I stole a word from you. And he said, that's okay. He said, because every single person that I ask about their why, they can't tell me. They don't have clarity. So just imagine for a moment, and I want you to just have a chat with your partner right now, just imagine if you, and when you write your award submission with your why, just imagine the judges. And even if you don't win this year, you know, when I, when I wrote eight award submissions, I crashed and burned in the first one. But I, like with Edward de Bono, we have our own map of the world. We have what well, I call it my own map of the world. And we naturally go to what we think down that same line that everybody else thinks because that's what we're used to doing. But you see, the beautiful thing about Edward de Bono is he came back and he didn't go down his map of the world. He started thinking outside that. So when you're writing your submission, and, and Robin's going to expand on this later on, and she'll give you some structure behind all of this. But if you have entered before and you haven't won, then go back and pull it apart. Reignite it. And then ask yourself, well, why am I entering? So just, I want you just to have a little bit of a conversation amongst yourselves around that. And then we'll, um, we'll do some more work. It's actually not about, and again, your why of entering, it's going to be different for all of you, for each and every one of you. But just imagine the clarity that you will get around all of these things. And if you haven't done, again, done well in the past, or if writing is not your forte, then get some help with that. But quite some years ago, I realised that I, had, I was very flawed with my personality, and I'm serious, I was extremely flawed. There were some things that I really worked in my weakness on. So I went and hired a coach uh, for two years, and I invested in, in a coach because I knew that if I didn't do that, then I would not be able to take those next steps. So don't try and do this on your own either. The best people in the world, Bill Gates, they say, is not partic particularly an intelligent person, but what he does know is he surrounds himself with good people. So also equally, don't be scared to get and form a group around these awards. Get people to check them off. Don't be, you, you know, it doesn't always have to cost you a fortune. Again, come back to Edward de Bono. Think a little bit outside that square. If you are going to write it, form yourselves into a group. Get some support in some way because there's a lot out there. So well done. Thank you. I'm, I hope that um, you're not going to hate me too much for pushing you and making you think or your brain hurt a little bit. I, I spoke to um, Deb Lewis. Everyone here, does every, anyone here know Deb Lewis? Well, Deb, yeah, you know Deb? Deb um, is a... Uh, a judge of the awards and has been last year as well with you, Rob. And I just asked Deb to put down some, uh, some things about, just give me a couple of key sentences about what her experience was. And who'd like to read out as it comes up? You don't want to hear my voice. Oh, yeah. yeah, you'll read it? Awesome. As leader of your organisation, it really depends on you to ensure your award submission a genuine and positive reflection on your overall operation, your vision, 
mission, values, and the overall customer experience you provide. Taking a team approach to working on Taking a team approach to working with its contents is incredibly valuable and worthwhile for many reasons. The end result, however, should be the story you are proud to showcase and ultimately at a national level. Judges are seeking the standards of excellence and innovation. A big hint for award submitters. Consider the actual language used. Take special note of grammar and punctuation and the overall flow of your submission not just its design and presentation. It's amazing how simple oversights like typical, yeah, typographical errors quickly do track from the story. All judges are extremely skilled at reading between the lines. Those unintentional messages can make the difference between a good submission and an award-winning submission. Well done. And of course, thank you very much for doing that. So of course, you'll see Deb's a current award, um, current Queensland Tourism Awards judge, and she's got a lot of experience with this. And again, um, I've got to refer forward on to Rob, who's going to expand on all of this for you and give you uh, a little bit more structure. When I, um, when I actually read and when we were talking about this, and this business best practice um, session, it really was about getting you to start thinking a little bit differently and start to figure out what your why is. So in summary, think outside the square when you're, when you're actually putting your submission together. I want you to, don't get caught up on this business best practice. Get caught up on your why, on your excellence, because the best practice will fall out of that. If you have absolute clarity about why you're doing what you're doing, that's going to flow through. And if, you, if you're not particularly good with your words, then go talk to Deb. What is your why? Think about your why. Think about why you're doing what you're doing, but at all sorts of different levels. I question myself every single day and make sure that I always come back to what my why is. And that's around people's potential. When it becomes about the money, I will be giving up what I'm doing. Show business best practice, and again, it will fall out of that. Be thorough, be attentive, be focused, and be true. And speak with your why. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed this part of this morning. What I would like to do is just go around and before we actually wrap up and you go and have, I think we're having a cup of tea, are we? <laughs> well done, go have a cup of tea. Thank you, you've been awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.